for those of you that um, might not be aware, uh, this is an artist talk with legendary artist Hunt Slonim uh, as part of our sixth annual Lauderdale Art Week here in the beautiful New River Fine Art Gallery on Las Olas in downtown Fort Lauderdale. If you didn't know about Lauderdale Art Week, we started a, the, the largest celebration of all forms of art in South Florida, not just visual arts, but performing, spoken word, there's light projection shows, comedy, musical events. There was a jazz fest with Grammy award-winning artists in Pompano. Uh, the week runs from January 20th to Sunday the 28th. Uh, we still have a closing party at the W Hotel in Fort Lauderdale, which will be pretty cool. There's an Art Hollywood uh, showcase of all the talented artists that live and work in Hollywood. You can find out more at lauderdaleartweek.com. And we'd like to host these uh, artist talks as part of our art discourse series of the Art Week to give our community front row access to brilliant minds and talented artists like Hunt. How many of you have heard Hunt speak before? All right, you're in for a treat. Um, so I'm gonna give him a little former bio here and uh, give him some context and then we'll get into things. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Hunt Slonim is a contemporary American artist known for his vibrant expressionistic paintings that often feature birds, bunnies, and other fauna, as well as religious, iconography. Born on July 18, 1951 in Kittery Point, Maine, Slonim grew up in Hawaii and Virginia where his fascination with nature began. He studied paintings at the Scohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine and received the Bachelor of Arts from Tulane University in Louisiana. During his early career, Slonim gained recognition for his bold use of color and his eclectic mix of subjects which ranged from tropical landscapes to portraits and still lifes. In the 70s, Slonim moved to New York City, where he became part of the vibrant art scene of the era. He quickly made a name for himself with his unique artistic style, drawing inspirations from his surroundings and his travels to ex exotic locales. Throughout his career, Slonim has held numerous solo exhibitions in galleries and museums worldwide, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the, the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, his artwork is highly sought after by collectors and can be found in private and public collections around the globe. In addition to his painting, Sonam is also a prolific writer and collector. He's authored several books on art, interior design, and his experiences as an artist. And known for his love of historic homes, Sonam has restored several properties, transforming them into stunning, stunning showcases for his artwork and collections. Uh, he continues to create art that captivates audiences with his bold colors, energetic brushwork, and whimsical charm. His work reflects his deep connection to the natural world and his ongoing exploration of spirituality and symbolism. But there's much more to this man than that. So I prepared a, a couple of questions that I kind of find interesting. I'd like to kick it off with some context of the current exhibition here, aptly called Hunt the Palooza. Uh, so you've had a prolific career that's led you to the current works we now see on display here with Lisa and New River Fine Art. And your artwork often features bunnies and rabbits as recurring motifs. Uh, let's start off by finding out what draws you to these creatures and how do they continue to inspire your current artistic endeavors? <clears throat> the rabbits in particular? In, in this, this oh, story, yeah. Well, I've lived with birds my whole life. I had a, almost 100 at one point <clears throat> in my studio. I currently narrowed, you know, found, found homes for a lot of them because I couldn't anymore. But I've, um, I've lived and worked with everything that you see in my paintings. Um, I have started aviaries in India at ashrams that I've been to. I, um, the rabbit, I'm the sign of the rabbit in the Chinese zodiac, which I didn't know, but I was painting saint paintings in the late 70s in New York. I moved to New York in 1973 um, from Louisiana, and I still have homes there, so I spend time there. I actually have a big show at the Cabildo, the State Museum in New Orleans. It's going to be up for a year of works of mine that are in collections in Louisiana. So that's been a big, <clears throat> big for um, inspiration in my life as well. I paint bayou paintings as well. I started doing landscapes and people at Gauhegan, um, so the bayous are an offshoot of that. Um, anyway, I was painting saints, and I always chose Saints that had something to do with the Americas, and I um, put animals around them. San Martin de Porres, in particular, I was asked to be in a Saints show in New York. It was a little bit popular in the 
80s, um, and I want I had just come back from Lima, and I wanted to paint Rose of Lima, which I'd already done a few versions of. They said, no, do San Martin de Porres. Anyway, I did it, and it was in this group show, and the Metropolitan Museum bought my painting on his saint's day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the Times and the Arts and Leisure section um, called Does Religion Has Impact on Contemporary Art? And then the Newark Museum bought that painting. And um, it was funny because there was a thing on Dynasty below me and that thing. I had a huge reproduction, which hasn't happened again to that degree. Um, anyway, I got to know Joan Collins a little bit. And I told her the proudest moment of my life was when I was above Dynasty in the arts and leisure section of the time. She didn't think that was interesting. But she, her son painted me, Sasha Newley. We became friends. Um, so why the? That's just what's captivated me my whole life. Nature is my total source of inspiration. Um, you can't beat it. I think that it's the most healing thing possible. Um, and the forms of birds have influenced everything. I mean, we're so fashion. You look at a Tibetan pheasant, and it looks like a jacket that they made for a priest or something. It's very specific to regions and in the mid and late 19th centuries and early 20th century, you know, the um, birds of paradise were so evident in all of fashion, um, almost to the point of it making them extinct. Um, and through history, I mean, I grew up in Hawaii a bit and we would go to the Bishop Museum, and the king's cloaks are made out of the two feathers of the mamo bird, which had, was either red or yellow, and the tail. And they would catch them and take two feathers. It took 300 years to make wow. King Kamehameha's cloak. Um, and you were punished by death if you killed the bird. So there was a great reverence for nature in times in the pre our you know, what's going on today. Um, the Mayan king's headdresses were made out of its all feathers. And again, it was a death sentence to kill okay, it's all. We have something like 15 left of on this planet. So I'm also pointing out how influential nature has been and how little of it is left and how we're destroying their habitats at such a rapid rate. It's just horrifying. I mean, what happened in Australia through the fires, I mean, oh my god, all those there were three billion animals killed, koala bear, that's just so terrible. And, um, and the cutting down of the rainforest, I mean, that's how we breathe. I mean, I don't know what we think we're doing to ourselves lungs, to make a McDonald's hamburger. Right, the lungs of the earth. We're making... You know, there's this quote that's so wonderful about a guy in a bulldozer in the jungles, devastating forms of nature that have never even been recorded and never will be. In fact, I was just sent pictures from Honduras from friends of mine who were back and forth to Louisiana of a toucan that has never been um, cataloged. It doesn't exist in anything. It's not completely, it's not just a fluky offshoot of another bird or a, a subsidiary of it. It's a brand new form of toucan. Unidentified. Unidentified, and the people whose home it visits do not want it identified because they know they'll come and take them away and probably kill them. I'm glad you're mindful of that, and I'm glad that you mentioned mindfulness and ashrams. Um, mindfulness in yoga has had a profound impact on my life, many people's lives here in the audience and in the community. Um, how does your practice of meditation influence your artistic process and uh, some of the themes that you've explored in your artwork? I noticed you had your mala beads out previously. Yes, I do them all all the time. I also do the rosary three times a day. Every little Since bit helps. COVID, you bet. I mean, well, it helps until you arrive, and then it's just a given. Um, which who knows if we will. But anyway, how has it helped? Well, I'm always influenced by my travels. I um, 
I've, it's funny because I was talking to a woman last night who was here as a dancer. And she was with Nikolai and my cousins were as well from Minnesota. And um, they introduced me to Mayor Baba's teaching, you know, don't worry, be happy. That's where it first came about. And then I, they gave me the book, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And I saw the first picture, I saw Babaji, the immortal Shiva mm -hmm. manifest. Anyway, um, so that resonated with me, and I um, have had, you know, it's just funny how things just unfold in your life. When I was in Guatemala, I met somebody who gave me a mantra and um, showed me meditation, and I had an out-of-body experience on that first meeting, which was pretty profound. Um, then I was introduced to various gurus. I went to India three times with Siddha Yoga and started an aviary there. But each experience is amazing. I wound up with Mother Mira, who's in Germany and is an avatar, born avatar. It's very different from being a right. guru. Anyway, I don't know how much you want to talk about this. How it inspired, how I these have inspired some of your works and some of the Well, series. it keeps me functional too, yeah. <laughs> so that I do them and my my painting is like my meditation I make these marks into the paint I paint the front and then I carve the brush to a point and I make marks and I often am saying a mantra while I'm doing it yeah. um, but it's just all interrelated and I don't see painting as separate from my meditation beautiful but you know it helps me to blank out I'm not you know, I do a lot of stuff spiritually every day. I just had a very amazing experience um, where I started going to St. Patrick's every day about a year and a half ago. And um, I met uh, Father, it's a long story, but Father Enrique Salvo, who's Nicaraguan. I had been an exchange student in Nicaragua, and I right. wanted to meet him desperately. He talked about growing up there and all this stuff in his family owned the ice cream companies, and they were related to the family that I lived with, but he's much younger than me, so I didn't know him. But he's still friends with a lot of the family that I lived with. Anyway, he came to me through the guy who does high clear gin, who wanted me to paint King Charles for something, which didn't happen. But I did get to meet Father Salvo, and his first words to me was that he wanted me to paint um, Pierre Toussaint, who... I didn't know about it. I'd heard the name. He is buried at St. Patrick's. Cardinal O'Connor took him from the original St. Patrick's down on Mulberry Street, which I used to live around the corner from. And um, he had been a slave in Haiti. His owner brought him and five people to New York after the um, big revolution there and sent him to hairdressing school, of all things, and he became the hairdresser to the stars. He did the hair of Mrs. Hamilton, the Fishes, the Stuyvesant, all the old families, and he made quite a lot of money. And he helped, gave money, and raised the rest of it to build the original St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. But he's um, not a saint yet, he's a blessed, and I was asked to do this painting of him, and I did three or four versions, and they really liked it. And now it's hanging next to um, the huge marble statue of um, St. Elizabeth and St. John the Baptist, and you can see it while Mass is being said. Wow. And when they unveiled it, the whole cathedral clapped, and it was just like really such a great connection to the divine to be asked to do this. I was just in tears. That's a pretty high honor mass. amongst oh. the career of many high honors. Well, that way up there on the list. What, what, would you, what, uh, what other experiences, either from your travels or exhibitions, uh, are also high up there on the list for you, having been at this for you know, a few years now? Well, I'm 72. I've been at this for at least 55 years. I've always been a painter since I was a little kid, so that was a no-brainer, thank God. My brother was talented in about 15 areas, and he became a writer, but um, could have done anything. 
I didn't have choices and I couldn't even get another job. So um, fortunately, I stuck it out. I say fortunately. I didn't have choices. I, I never have choices in life. It's just like, boom, that's your path. And, and I don't, was delusional to think that something would happen, but I always believed it would. Um, it's never easy. And um, the more that happens, the more um, you have to deal with. It's quite, you know, I, sleep, I slept well here last night. I don't wake up in New York with a calm... Well, I wake up calm and then all the shit kicks in. And dealing with all these people that I work with in my studio. Anyway, I love painting. That's the glue and the meditation of my day. And I hate not painting. So that's a. I would never, you know, people talk, I hear all these people talk about retirement. I mean, that's the wonderful part about artists is that you never heard, hear of artists retiring. We don't want to go play golf or, <laughs> you know, and I'm doing everything I want to do anyway. Um, what was the equivalent? Well, of what are, in, a, in a career of highlights. Oh, uh, what are the other highlights? What are highlights? some of the highlights that you... Well, I mean, there's so many. Each one, each show has highlights. The each, memorable ones. Well, they're all memorable. <laughs> India was very profound. I got to go to Tirupati. Um, I had I went to India to have a show. The gallery had not even the first brick hadn't been put in place. Wow. Six weeks later to the day, I had the opening, and I had to get on a plane and leave. It was the most fabulous opening I've ever had. Um, they had just India is so such splendor when it, they have it. It was just unbelievable. Um, I, okay, Tirupati is a place I was meditating at in this cave um, at the ashram, and I didn't realize it, but there was a statue of Vishnu who's at Tirupati outside, but I didn't know who it was or anything. And I get to Madras to have my other show, and they said, oh, we're going to Tirupati, but we don't know if you can come because they really don't like Western. Anyway, it's this place for 1,200 years they've been reciting the names of God, you know, the 1,200 names of God daily. So it's so powerful. The car broke down as we were going. I mean, every obstacle known to man. There's, you, most people have their shaved, heads shaved before they go in. They wash your feet. You're allowed to stand in front of the statue for five seconds or something. And the eyes are covered. They say if they weren't, it would burn a hole in you. It's so powerful. Anyway, anything you wish there comes true, they say. And mine did come true. <laughs> oh. When was this? What year was that? It was in the 80s, about 86. Wow. Glad that that wish came true for you. Um, well, I need another one now. All right, ready we'll, to go maybe, back. We'll make, maybe we'll make a trip back. <laughs> so that was just one list. thing. I mean, you know, going to Scandinavia was great. Going to Japan. Um, the Philippines, I got to visit. Tony Del Dios had the largest private bird collection in the world. He had billions of sphinx macaws, which they say are extinct in the books that you read. I was given a glory of the seas cone by the president's son, which they said there were only three of in the world in the books when I was growing up. I think they found a few more. But Thankfully. anyway. Thrilling things like that mean the world to me. You, you've mentioned the birds a few times. You mentioned some of the aviaries, and you mentioned how the, the birds have influenced your work. What has been the goal, or what, are the, what have creating these aviaries meant for you? What do you want the world to know about these aviaries, and, and how have creating these aviaries impacted your life? Well, it's um, a wonderful... It's being locked up in New York, which is an urban jungle. I have to create a jungle in my home. I always have orchids blooming and plants and birds and noise. You know, it's just part of the environment that I need in order to paint. I would never take a bird out of captivity to keep it that way. I was, I've only taken on birds that were needed homes. And, you know, some, very few people keep birds for very long. Right. They're very high maintenance, and um, they don't all get along. You have to watch them like a hawk. 
And it's a real, um, you know, they have to be clean three times, four times a week. A huge variety of food if they're read, fed correctly. Uh, what do I get out of it? I mean, I watch them, I paint them every day. They're working animals. I mean, I always say Audubon killed everything he painted. I mean, he was known to have stabbed a bald eagle to death in a classroom once. I mean, literally, he killed every animal he painted. I don't. Thank, thank you. <laughs> so I have working animals. I had a bird that was in its 80s that I recently was able to give to a uh, place where they take in animals. Rescue. More than a rescue. Um, sanctuary. Sanctuary. And they have the best medical help in the world. And this bird had gone blind. And they were able to operate and bring its vision back, and it's flying again. So, Beautiful. yeah, but they can live to 100. I, well, and we appreciate you doing that, and we appreciate you not killing the birds. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting how your travels and these experiences can shape your life and your work. I was just in the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica, and I saw a macaw flying freely uh -huh. for the first time in my life in the most biodiverse place on the planet. And it changed the way that I view birds. And it changed the way that I view nature. Um, you've mentioned, and I was reading in some of my research, that you experienced synthesia. Um, how, and for those that maybe aren't familiar, if you could give some context, at what that means for you uh, experiencing synthesia and how that influences your perception of color and then some of the work that you've been creating. Can you define synthesia, what? seeing colors and, and patterns? I don't recall no? using oh. that, but bad research. I, I do the colors and patterns, and I would say that kind of sums up my work. I like the word exotica as well, which is anything that's not known. And I, you know, moving to Hawaii as a kid from New Hampshire was all about seeing all the things that I always dreamed of, and raising orchids and. Um, so I create pattern out of most of what I see in nature. Um, I don't know, is there a further definition no, that, of that, that, that world? No, that suffices. Um, and for those that are not aware, you do have some books here that we're going to be signing after the talk. This is the newest. Well, it's actually not, but it's about my homes. And um, I consider them part of my art, the homes. I, I get so excited about these things when I see them in the castle that I have in um, Massachusetts and um, Great Barrington. I'd heard about about 20 years ago. It was a school. Um, never thought it would be for sale. And um, a friend of mine knew the person. Anyway, they decided to get rid of it, and I, they didn't even put it on the market, and I was able to get it. They've been asking astronomical amounts of money. It's on 80 acres in the middle of Great Barrington, and it's a 68,000 square foot structure, hmm. which I have filled up <laughs> to the point. Of, I still have a bunch of suits of armor on their way. But, um, and I collect 19th century painting. Um, I have contemporary painting, I've traded with a lot of people. But I'm, my bigger focus is because of the frames and, you know, the whole thing of the Gilded Age, which is real. Um, this is a great example of it. But the, um, I love the way you can mix it into all these different levels of time. I love the idea of time travel. We actually um, have had a lot of experience. Of it. I've had to hire Ghostbusters at the Armory. All of us have seen things and whatever, but that's the Armory. A lot of stuff happened in that building. Everything from Rachmaninoff playing the piano to five American presidents speaking there. So there's this great history. But, you know, a lot of not so great things happened there too. And there are 20 miles of tunnels that run underneath it, which I've only walked into part of it. I find it really spooky and weird. What but. are you filling these, these homes up with? Aside from your art, um, I know you have a, 
quite a collection of eccentricities and oddities and things. Well, furniture and paintings and sculpture. And I love saving period furniture. And I make some fabrics. This is the ballroom at one of my houses. Um, we brought the chandelier in, which was, we had to support the roof. <laughs> Dang it. And getting it in the door, it had to be disassembled in ways that were almost impossible. But it happened. It's always sort of miraculous. The, the curtains, I'm not supposed to use that word, the draperies were, um, took me six years to make a decision on what to use. Um, anyway, these are, I just pump life into things that have been pretty beastly. And there's a lot of space in 68,000 Yeah, and feet. I just never run out of stuff to fill them with. So now, uh, you know, as a published author, can you tell us a little bit about how your literary pursuits interact with your... Well, I'm not the, this is written by, this isn't even considered my book. Okay, it's this one. That, I, you know, there are quotes of, from me all yes. through it. But um, this is Brian Coleman, who's done millions of books on 19th century things. Um, what's the question? Uh, how your literary pursuits and how they interact with your visual arts. I'm, it's mostly quotes. I mean, I could write a book. I'm talking about writing a life story. I don't know if there are that many people that would want to read it, but... I'm attempting to do that. Um, these are mostly pictures and records of subject matters. I have a bunny book, a bird book, and a butterfly book so far with this author. Um, the houses, I do installations with my paintings in museums. The um, Cabildo is partially installed with furniture of mine and whatnot. I did... Um, all kinds of installations in other places at Baton Rouge. I did the LSU Museum, the Shaw Center, and we borrowed furniture from Rao. Um, and it was really a walk through a house with the art. I love the idea of the studio being as significant as the work it comes from. I mean, Picasso influenced me tremendously as a kid. Or you'd always see things in Life magazine of Picasso and his chateaus, and he'd buy another one and lock the door, and that was kind of made me very excited as a kid. Um, so that's sort of where this is coming from. I, um, I don't remember. Oh, I, I did the Colby Museum. Um, oh, there's so many I can't remember everything. Well, I know the one question that everybody has here is, what is this big? rabbit over there. Could you tell us a little bit of the story of how these sculptures have come into play? During COVID, I was um, having talks with people that were had worked with Chihuly, and um, they decided they would do projects with me. We started with the glass. I flew to Seattle and learned how to blow glass. And um, we then did bronze. And these came about while I was there, and I picked some of the frames and how we would mount fabric behind them. So it was a whole new range. I've done sculpture for 30 years, mostly wooden sculpture in-house. And then I've done big, huge metal sculptures in Louisiana that are hand-painted. I did most of them in Mississippi. Um, but I was never able to do glass or, you know, I'd always dreamed of doing glass and metal. And then we started with the mosaics. I had done one other huge mosaic in West Palm Beach years ago. But these are four uh, show that I'm having, the first of which is in a, it's a botanical garden orientation. That's where it's going to be. San Antonio Botanical Garden. Um, is where these will all be in um, May of this year. Okay. Then it'll probably go to other museums. And we're very fortunate to now have one in our community, in Wilton Manors, that was unveiled yesterday. Um, well, ribbon cutting. Ribbon cutting, yes, <laughs> correct. And 
We won't get into to how that arrived there, but um, so what a uh, weird story. You couldn't make this stuff up. Um, before I, I will give an opportunity for the audience to ask questions, but before that, uh, we do have some artists in attendance here. Some, yeah. uh, some noteworthy, some mid-career, some emerging artists. Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring artists who are just starting out on their own creative journeys? I wouldn't um, advise people creatively particularly. I think it's very hard to teach art unless you're just learning drawing and that sort of thing. And I had a lot of, I love to draw from the model. I used to love that. Okay. It's a luxury I don't have time to do anymore. Um, and it was very powerful for me to do that. And then you get in, you know, as you, what would I say, diligence, persistence. I mean, I was very inspired by something Philip Perlstein said at the Skowhegan School. He applied for a Fulbright 16 years in a row before he got one, but he never gave up. And I took his advice and I got an NEA after not 16 years. Janet Fish, I think, was on the committee who was somebody who I've had an association with. Um, so just keep applying, keep trying, never give up. I used to send stuff out. Alex Katz would say it's 50% making the art and 50% promoting it. You know, and he would kind of said he would divide his year in that way. He, I was in Marlborough Gallery for 18 years and he spoke to Pierre LeVay and got me into Marlboro which is another funny story. I was taken on by Fishbach Gallery when I was 24 in New York, and Altoon Sultan had been too, and then Alex Katz got her into Marlboro wow. across the street. And I, at that time, it was a big, major gallery. And I said, someday I'll get her. <laughs> and it actually happened. But I'm not, it's kind of, the whole thing is falling apart. But I, I do better without them anyway. Um, so just keep, never give up and never assume anything's a given. I hate it when people think that things are just going to happen. Right. I mean, believe, right. but persist. Persistence is everything. And I just have a drum beating inside of me where I can't stop. Um, I think some people... Can't stop creating. Creating and I take opportunities, you know, I do... A lot of stuff. I was just meeting with somebody else the other night. Wants to have nothing to do with galleries and does her own thing. And um, Louisiana has kind of a system where artists have their own gallery spaces, like George Rodrigue did. They were never with galleries. Sure. They promote their own work. In New York, that's not really the way it's done. Um, and it's a rough road. Yeah. Anyway. But it's all good. I love the opportunity of showing all over creation. And um, some of my greatest experiences have been um, having shows in strange places. And I've had shows in museums in Argentina. Uh, I've been in Guatemala. I even showed in Haiti, the Museum of Haitian Art. And Aristide was president at that time. And he turned off the lights for my opening, because he hadn't been invited by, for some political <laughs> reason. So we had a candlelight opening. Was that the first candlelight opening you ever? It's the only one I've had so far. Um, and it was great, you know. But it was quite a, it was a. Can't make a, this stuff up. No. Just like the bunny in uh, Wilton Drive. But um, <laughs> that's, another, tell you that's, more that's like another story that. for another day. Yeah, um, that sure I is. will want to give this context um, for the current state of arts, specifically here in Fort Lauderdale, where we're currently located hosting this talk. We're super grateful for Lisa Burgess and New River Fine Art for continually bringing world-class artists like yourself to our downtown corridor, to our main street, to Las Olas, um, art can be many different things for many different people. Art could be history, art could be storytelling, art could be interior design, art could be an investment. And by elevating the arts and by bringing these noteworthy museum quality artists, it really does add a, a much needed uh, boost to the cultural fabric and, and, and growth that we're trying to accomplish here in Fort Lauderdale. I'm sure you know, this isn't Miami, 
uh, where they have Art Basel. But we're doing our best here with our sixth annual Lauderdale Art Week, which we're currently in the middle of right now. And having the artists be present here for the talks and giving our community front row access to brilliant minds like yourself um, really does help to that cult uh, add to that cultural fabric and help establish us as a well-cultured destination, which we're striving hard to be. So I just wanted to give a, a moment to say thank you to Lisa and the New River Fine Art team for a con uh, for, for continually elevating the arts here on Las Olas. This is arguably one of the finest galleries that we have here, one of the finest collections. She participates in a lot of the major art fairs, um, and it really helps redirect traffic and attention back here to Fort Lauderdale. Anything you would like to say? I know you exhibit. Listen, I you know I hear everybody here apologizing for you know trying to, and you're not. I don't think that way. I mean, to me, this is as important as anything. And I'm thrilled with her efforts, with Lisa's efforts. And I'm thrilled to be showing in this space. She's done wonderful things. And I think it's all important. And, um, you know, we live in an age, um, I don't know how to say this politically. Please, correct. no, say it. This is the non-political correct. Well, the pendulum has just swung so much that people like me, well, I'm not going to say people like me. Anyway, there's a certain um, In the art world, thing, in the art market. Yeah, that yeah. is happening that um, is really um, oriented towards women and whatever, whatever. I don't want to go there. But um, so I'm thrilled that Lisa has embraced my work. We've had two wonderful shows. I think the first one was at a time when I really didn't want to travel sure. because of COVID. I mean, sure. we were scared. Right. I mean, 800 people a day were dying in New York during COVID. It was very isolating. But a lot of interesting things came out of it, and I feel... Like we're sort of over it, but people are still getting COVID all over the place, right. but not as severely. I mean, it was real. Anyway, the two things, oh, <laughs> big thing happened in New York, you know, the Trade Center thing. I had a big mural in Tower One of That's right. the Trade Center, one of the nice, you know, when I was struggling, I was hired under the Cultural Council Foundation Artists Project, which is the recreation of the WPA under the Carter administration, Joan. Mondale, who they called Joan of Art at that time, <laughs> um, was part of, you know, supportive of that. And for two years, we were paid to do paintings, which people like Gorky and Pollock had done. And they sold their paintings as steam pipe wrapping after they were through. That's, that's Bless our government. Um, so I got to do, I was selected. Three people were picked to do murals at the Trade Center. And I was one of them. And the first time it was bombed, we were paid to come in and touch them up. And the second time I watched the plane. Anyway, that was a rough one. <laughs> because we didn't know whether we would live through the day. Right. It was really, you know, living in New York, I don't know how you felt here. But we didn't know really where this would go or right. stop. You know, things explode. And, and we had fires for a year. I don't think people realize how bad it was, and people were not told not to come back to work, and a lot of them are dying of cancer and respiratory diseases because it wasn't safe. Anyway, so I watched my mural be totaled, uh, the whole world and many people I knew as well. And we had that, and then we had the blackout right after that. Um, and, you know, I had to go through things like my studio at that time was on a 10th floor. I had living animals. I had to walk in the dark um, up. There were no elevators. Feel my way across. There were no lights that were, you know, they're supposed to have emergency lighting, which I never do. Anyway, so we got through all that. Um, the first blackout in New York, I remember I... Um, you know, it, it was hot, there was no street lights. It's wonderful to see how New Yorkers will go out and direct traffic, and it's really amazing. We were taken through grocery stores with flashlights um, because there was no food available. It was really crazy. Anyway, um, and then the day it was over, we all 
you know, we went to Studio 54. <laughs> and you would think nothing had happened. It was just amazing to see everybody gather. It was just an amazing period of New York life, but it was so edgy. Everything was very edgy back then. Now it's all about money. I would like to ask money. you one last question about New York, and then I will turn it over to the, to the uh, crowd here. So you've been in New York for quite some time, and you've seen the art scene evolve from the, you know, Warhol, Basquiat, you know, Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf days, Soho, to where it is now. Could you speak to the current state of affairs and how it's in influence your work and showings and gallery exhibits? I've just always paid attention to what I'm doing. Sure. I've never, you know, my brother worked for Warhol. My cousin wrote the book Slaves of New York. The Warhol was going to turn into a movie, but he died. That was bad. Um, he was only like 58 or something. Anyway, rough stuff. But um, anyway, so Merchant and Ivory did her book as a movie. Um, and you would see him everywhere. You know, it's really, we, I, with Chris Makos, we went to nightclubs sometimes. Um, but he was just so ever present. It was, you know, there are certain fixtures of people that I don't feel that we have so much anymore. Right. People don't gather in that way. I remember I used to get into Studio 54. They interview, I was on there. Studio 54, whatever it is, they interview people every week. And um, I came with uh, George O'Keefe's husband, Juan Hamilton, who was a young guy, and, oh. and Marisol. We had just been at a party. And they said, he's not getting in. I said, do you know who that is? He said, I don't care. He's not getting in. So Marisol, <laughs> anyway. Um, but if they didn't like the way you looked or something, forget it. There was, <laughs> and there were wonderful things. I remember the Jaipur ball. It was so extravagant in those days. Um, anyway, I don't see that I, kind of I, thing. So I draw much. a lot of inspiration from that period. I was heavily impacted by. I was not around then, obviously, but by watching the Basquiat documentaries. And the last one, Boom For Real, about his teenage years, starts with Gerald Ford quoting, uh, as a wrecking ball is going through the city, saying, the federal government is not going to bail out Manhattan. Top dead New York City. Correct. We're going to let it burn down. Beam and, was our mayor. And to think that 50 years ago, this place was potentially going to burn down, and I like to attribute the artists and the arts playing a major role in the revitalization of Soho, Manhattan, the art scene, the art world, until so, we're kicked out. <laughs> so, so that kind of leads into the current state of affairs here in Fort Lauderdale, where I'm you know, born and raised from in this community, where we really haven't had such a strong art scene, but we've seen through the power of the arts, through the growth and success of you know, the former arts districts here in Flagler Village and in Fat Village, through some of the progress with the programs and Zero Empty Spaces and the Art Week and the things we're doing, this is making this a, a, a more vibrant, well-cultured community. And the arts have the ability to bring people together to foster senses of community and to make this not only a better place to vacation, but a better place to live because we live here. So I applaud you guys for being here and coming and showing up and supporting the arts, being part of these conversations, being part of these events, because this is literally, you know, if nobody shows up, then we're not going to continue doing these events. So um, I always just wanted to give a, a moment to say thank you guys for being here. And uh, with that being said, I will turn it over if anybody has any questions uh, in the audience. I want to say one more Please, thing. Please, go ahead. Because you were asking me how the recent times have affected yes. my work. Through withdrawal. I mean, the busier you get, the more you turn inward and do your own thing and don't think about, you know, you don't compare. Today, it's just about who can afford to do, you know, whatever. Anyway. Everything is, it's the level of money involved in the career almost, which is sad state of affairs, sort of. Um, but we've broken through never, I mean, this is the most diverse period of history in the arts. That's why I would never tell anybody what to do. Um, because there are things that I don't even understand. You know, I'm doing NFTs that we're releasing next week. I don't even know what an NFT right. really is. 
Um, but I want to enter that media. Um, so I just feel like it's more of an inward journey, more meditation, more internal, um, just it comes from within. I never make conscious decisions that I'm going to change my work in some way. These things just happen. I mean, I do diamond dust. There's a blue diamond dust over there. I helped um, Rupert Smith make a Warhol diamond dust in the 70s or 80s, which was my first experience with it. We did a big shadow thing, and I helped lift it or whatever. And then my Bulgarian dealer gave me diamond dust. He gave me Mark Quinn and Damien Hurst diamond dust said, use this in your work. And it's really hard to figure out how to do it properly. Anyway, we found a resin and it added a whole new thing to what I do. Um, but it wasn't something that I just woke up one day and right. thought I'm going to order diamond dust. Right, right. Like the metallics have been a, played a big part in my work and I mix them into paint. So we're con because my subject matter is... Um, pretty consistent, I can play with media more now. And it's just this real ritual. I mean, the rabbits are like calligraphy for me. I'd start the day doing series of little ones to kind of warm up for, you know, I do 100 foot painting sometimes. I love working on a large rather than a small scale. But through the frames and the idea of the studies, I um, do these walls, the salon style hanging walls. Um, which have emerged over the last 20 years, and they've become a big part of what I show. So I just wanted to say I'm sure. not as influenced by what's going on now. It's more turning inward. Amen. And I, because I, I don't even so vast. I mean, going to art fairs gives me such a headache. I've had to speak at a few. It's a, just bombardment on such a high level. Wish we would have had you around when we were doing an art fair down the street inside of mansions that people got to on a boat. We'll plan to bring that back, and we'd love to have Sounds you great. when we do that. Um, but yes, let's, uh, let's turn it over if anybody has any questions in the audience here for Hunt. Question. Um, it's, uh, I, uh, but if you're early, you're early thinking, early, in your early mornings, you do that mentorship. Someone's saying to you, you're being, you should like, keep doing these monies. Do them first. Is there, there someone that... That says to you encourage you with a mentor tell you the days you're just like, okay, I'm gonna keep doing I just do what I do. Do what you do and then all of a sudden they start Well, I had no idea anybody would like them or buy them. When, or, when, did, they, when did they first start to like make a difference? Well the bunnies really kind of took off on their own, but I've been painting bird paintings for a long time and the cage thing came about spontaneously after one of my trips to India. I just, I was painting birds, but I wasn't painting the cage. And this idea of including, you know, I was looking at everything through a grid, really. And then the light was from the street. And it was 20, you know, New York is never dark. So there was um, this sense of 24-hour um, light. Sometimes I used to put circles in to show um, headlights and ambulances and whatever. Um, so no, there was no particular encouragement. I just have always shown. 